Hello, 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 and welcome to the Grow Giver Podcast with Stephen Crawford, Malcolm Finlayson, and Justin Hoke. We are so excited to have you here on this Friday. It's going to be absolutely amazing. We've got a phenomenal guest who is not quite here yet, so we're waiting for him to arrive, but we can entertain you until then. We are the Grow Giver, the Three Amigos Podcast. We're so excited to have you with us. Abraham has just showed up. Here we go. Hey, brother, how you doing? I was on the wrong link. You sent me two links. I was on the wrong one. <laughs> I sent you two links? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah, I can't believe we did that. Ah. There was a, no, it was, one was a StreamYard, one was a Google Meet. I, I was on the Google Meet. All right, anyway, we're good now. Ah, well, I'm so glad that you're here with us. It's going to be an exciting show. We're very, very stoked to have you on the show. Um, yeah, Abraham. Right. Yeah, um, I was hoping that you would start off by giving us a little bit of your backstory, brother. Yeah, so how far back do you want me to start? Um, I don't know. What'd the cradle look like? No. Cradle? Yeah, so the cradle. <laughs> I didn't even have a cradle. I never needed a cradle. No, but, a cradle. Uh, no so, I mean, I grew up, um, you know, uh, my parents were divorced when I was like you know, one years old, so I kind of lived with my mom for a little while, then moved to my dad's for a little while, and then kind of just went from, probably when I was like 11, 12, I started going from like foster family to foster family. And I um, ended up in a boarding school. And then after the boarding school, I went to a few more different foster families and then ended up with my grandmother here in Atlanta. And that's how I ended up in Atlanta. So um, when I was 15 is when I moved to Atlanta with my grandmother. And I started off uh, my first business when I was when I moved with her, and I started selling baseball cards because I collected them my whole life. And I started going to shows, you know, and just dealing with people um, that had booths. And then eventually, I had my own booths and just kind of grew it to a bigger and bigger business. And um, that's, that's pretty much how I started making money and uh, got into real estate in my early twenties. Twenty two is when I got into real estate. Just so uh, yeah, I'm 47 right now. So real okay. estate about about 25 years in real estate, about 32 years in business. Love it. Yeah, I'm uh, 47 as well. So uh, I guess we're in the same club. Yeah. Um, 1975. Although, 19, you born 1975. 1975. Yeah. yeah nice. So although although I've never done MMA, and it, from the pictures on your social yeah. media, it looks like you have. Yeah, I've done uh, I've done a lot of martial arts growing up. And um, I just, uh, at some point, I just wanted to kind of test myself to see how I stood. But I, I started really, really late. I was 38 when I had my first fight. So I, I was, uh, I, that's kind of, that's when people are already retired. But I did it like from 38 to like 42, something like that. Oh, hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah, but no, uh, my dad used to collect ball cards. He, uh, he collected tops. Uh, what were they? Yeah. I think it was uh 58 through 60. He had, he had a, like a, a certain three years that he tracked down. I remember going to shows with him when I was a kid and checking them all out. And he has, he has a, like this, a grip of cards from when he was a kid in the sixties and uh, stuff like that, man. Uh, you still collect cards at all? No, I don't collect them, but um, I, I know, I know a little bit about them, but it's changed so much. Like I kind of got out yeah. of them uh, back, you know, let's see, I, I would say, uh in the late nineties, maybe 2000, I, I kind of stopped right around 2000. So it, it's been a while over 20 some years. Yeah. Mine was, oh, 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 go sorry, ahead. Go I was going to say my, mine, my sport that I always collected hobby wise was football. I loved football cards. Yeah, that was my favorite. So I, I was born in Miami and I grew up in Miami when I was little and um, they didn't have a baseball team or basketball team. They had nothing. You know, there was no such thing as the Marlins or heat. It was only the dolphins. So like we only right. really, did football, but, um, yeah. So basically, you know, I got to where from sports cards, you know, when I was 15, I was making a thousand a week and, you know, when I was 16, I was making a couple thousand a week. And then, you know, 17, 18, 19, I started making a lot more. I was, I was able to save like a million bucks by the time I, I, I was like 20. And, um, I just used that money to go into other businesses. So from baseball cards, I got into Beanie Babies, which was like the hot thing back in 1997. So in 1997, I was really big. In I was like the biggest Beanie Baby dealer like in the country. I was selling tractor trailers every every single uh, week out, um, and uh, made you know 
lots of money in Beanie Babies. And then from there, just got into other hot stuff. You know, there was Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, um, all kinds of other kids collectibles. And from there, just uh, had a lot of other businesses. I bought, I started some businesses and I bought a lot of businesses out that were competitors to like grow my business. And um, my biggest business I started back in like 2007, 2006, 2007, it was a jewelry. We went and we bought gold from people. So I was like the first one in the country that ever did this. I opened up a store and I just put tables in there and I advertised, bring your gold and we'll buy it. And literally I just had people coming in selling us their gold and coins and watches and diamonds and anything of value. And I would just buy it and then I would uh, melt all the gold and then you know, if there's anything nice, I would try to find some uh, jewelry stores or some or somebody that wanted to buy this stuff for a little bit more. But that's what I did for about seven years. And that was the business I made the most money in. So I had like over 300 stores in the country at one point, all over the country. And that, that was a business that, you know, we did, I did over $100 million in profit in that, in that seven year period. And um, from there, you know, I, I, I just did tons, tons of other businesses. I've had hundreds of different businesses since then and, and, and before then. And I've bought thousands of properties. The last couple of years, I've bought over 300 properties a, a year and fixed and flipped most of them. Uh, a lot of them I have as rentals. I have like a couple hundred, two, 300 that I'm holding right now. And, um, you know, for the last two years, I've been buying close to 30 a month. Since like September, October, it's dropped to 20 a month. Now it's like always between 15 and 20 a month. And the last month was 17. But um, I used to buy like 80, 90% cash and maybe 10% to 20% creative. Now it's almost like 65, 75% creative and 25% cash because the market's gone down so much that it's, it's hard to get the cash deals at, at a price uh, in a price that you need to buy it at to where you can fix it and flip it and make money. So I'm buying a ton of creative deals. Um, I post some on Facebook here and there. I used to post like every day a different house, but it was like too much. So I only post like maybe one or two a week now, but um, I'm buying tons more houses than I post, but create creative, uh, creative is the way to do it right now. Really. And that's how I buy businesses too. Do you think that's that awesome. um, you were saying that, you, you know, due to the way the market has shifted that now you're buying more creative. And I, I think that has a lot to do with sellers, not, really understanding that and they still want prices before yeah. do you think that the market is going to shift again back so you can start doing deals in cash again or do you yeah. think that before that happens sellers will actually have to come to grips with the reality of the situation and we're going to be able to buy deeper and start doing cash deals again so here, here's the thing um i'm still buying cash deals and i'm still fixing flipping it's just a, a smaller amount so the, the reason why i can't buy more is because People just want too much for them because they think they're worth more. But a lot of people, it's not that they want more money for it. They owe too much on it. They couldn't sell it for what I need to buy because they have to come to the closing table with 20, 30, 40 grand a lot of times. So they can't, they can't sell even if they wanted to. So, um, but as far as what I think the market is going to happen, I, I definitely think the market's going to stay the same or go down for the next six months um, okay. because interest rates keep going up. And that's the big reason why, why the markets tank so bad. Um, but I still think that there's an opportunity to buy some fix and flips. However, um, you got to be a little careful. So over the last two years, up until like August, right? Up until August of 2020, I literally never lost money on a home. And I'm buying 30 a month. I never lost money. I made, I'm making really good money on every home. And it wasn't because I was like just never made mistakes, right? I made mistakes. I bought some stuff I shouldn't have bought or, you know, something I didn't see. But any time that I was going to lose money on something, I just didn't sell it. And two, three, four months later, it was worth 10, 20% more. So it caught up, right? That's the reason why I was never losing money. Um, and, you know, that's why you were able to make such big profits. Thought, things that you thought you were going to make 30, 40, 50 grand on, sometimes you made 80 or 90 because it just kept going up. But since August, September, it's been the opposite. So not only can you not make mistakes, even if you're buying it, you know, close enough to where you can make something, by the time you fix it up and sell it, if it's three, four months later, you've lost all the money that you would have made. So I've actually started losing money on 20% of the homes I bought since August. But mm. again, I've, I've made so much money on, on some of the homes that I'm buying that I'm losing small amounts on, on the ones I'm losing on. So it's still really good. But um, the, reason why I'm able, the reason why I'm buying so many creative deals is because um, I could pay people the higher price, right, that they want. 
like if somebody owes 200,000 on their house and you know, it's only worth 160, they can't sell it, but you could still pay them 200 if you buy it on a creative deal, because when you're buying it for cash, you pretty much are buying it to fix and flip pretty much. Right. Um, and you have to have that margin to make money, but when you're buying it creatively, you're just buying it for cash flow. So, you know, I'm paying 200, even though it's worth 160 potentially. Um, I try not to buy it for that much more than it's worth, but in theory, you could, if the mortgage is 1200 and the rent's 1800, it doesn't matter because you're cash flowing every single month. And if you're paying them 200, they owe 200, you don't have to give them any cash up front. You know, I always give people at least a thousand just so there's some transaction, but for the most part, you don't have to give them much money. You can start cash flowing day one. So, um, and that's what I do with businesses. With businesses, I just want to buy businesses that are cash flowing, right? I have, I have a lot of criteria for businesses that I buy, but there's three main ones. The main ones are they have to cash flow and they have the cash flow minimum six figures a year. Um, so, and I prefer like at least multiple six figures, but I will, I will take stuff that's only doing a hundred thousand a year, but I really want 200,000 or more a year. Um, so that's my first thing. I, I don't want to buy businesses that don't cash flow at least that much. There are always exceptions I can tell you about. Um, the next important thing is that there has to be management in place. When I buy a business, I don't want the owner of that business to have been running the business and everybody you know, knows the owner and, and expects the owner to you know, do all these different things. They have to have a management in place. They have to have a team. They have to have employees. If the, if the owner leaves and they're like a big part of the business, the business could fall apart. Right. So you don't want that. Like um, you have to buy it. So that you have to buy a business that already has people in place. Um, once in a while, you know, I, I have someone I can put in place, but that's an exception. And then of course, the third thing is just like in real estate, you have to find motivated sellers. Uh, that's super important. If you don't find motivated sellers and you're going to, you know, that very well from real estate, um, you're just not going to get a good deal. You're not going to get the right terms. You're not going to get. So the crazy thing that's different between real estate, I think I've, I've made most of my money in business, although I made a shit ton in real estate too, but like, you know, together, I, I love doing both. People always ask me, would you rather do business or rather do real estate? I wouldn't, I would always do both. Like I wouldn't, you know, they're, they're good for different things and they both do really well. But with, with business, um, the big difference between business and real estate is when you, you know, most people are selling real estate, they expect to get paid all the money up front. Obviously we do some creative deals. That's like one tenth of 1% of deals that ever exists. It's creative, right? Most people it's, it's typical you pay cash or you get a loan and you pay the seller at closing. In business, it's the opposite. Literally, um, when you buy a business, it's almost expected that the owner finances some of it. Like sometimes they only finance a small amount, maybe 10%, uh, but sometimes they finance 20, 50%, 80%. And if you're really, really good and you find the right motivated um, sellers, you can get them to sometimes finance 100%. Um, I know a lot of people in, over the last year that have got people to finance 100%, and there's a reason why. But I typically know that people will always finance 20 to 50%. It's almost for sure. And let's, let's just say that you want to, um, let's just say that you could come up with all the money, right? And you could pay them because maybe you could get loans or whatever, or you know, have you know, private equity or, or um, whatever. I would still never pay a seller ever 100% of the money up front. I'd always make them you know, have some sort of owner finance because mm -hmm. it's so different than real estate. In real estate, when you go comp and figure everything out, you're looking at what does it cost to make this property livable or sellable in the MLS? And you just go and you, okay, the rehab is going to be 50,000. That's it. You don't need the seller. In business, there's a hundred different things you need the seller for. They have customers that they deal with once a year that like you might need to ask them questions about. There's employees you have to deal with. There's deals that they've made with all different vendors, with all different sellers, with all different customers, with all different employees. You, you, you know, you, you can't get all that stuff by, you know, you know, in due diligence, sometimes there's stuff that gets left out because you just, there's so much stuff is you can't remember everything. So you need that seller to help you. And you need that seller to help you for a lot of different things in the business for a certain amount of time. Um, so you, you know, depending on the business, sometimes it's maybe a month or three months. Sometimes you might need them for six months, a year plus. And um, the minimum seller finance that I've ever done or seen for the most part is around three years. So that way, if a seller is owed money by you, they are going to help you because they want you to do good and they want to get their money. Right. So, and it's part of the deal when you, when you do it, but I have a lot of seller finance deals that are five years. I have one crazy one that's 20 years, which is very unheard of. Most people are three to five years on, on a seller finance, 
But here's the difference between real estate. There's a lot of differences between real estate and business. In, in business, the way you value a property, is, the way you value a business, typically for the small types of businesses that we buy, and a small business is like something that makes, you know, that does less than $10 million a year in revenue, somewhere between two and three times uh, multiple of what it makes. So if a business makes $100,000 or 200, let's say a business makes $100,000, you're paying somewhere between two and 300,000 for it. That's what you're gonna pay. So you can, when you buy a business, you should be able to pay it back off within three to five years because you're only paying a two to three times multiple. Mm. Um, when, you're, when you're buying, you know, apartments or houses, you know, the cap rates are five, six, seven, eight. It takes 15 years to pay it back, you know? Yeah. So, so it's, it's different. That's what, that's why you need a 30 year amateurization on real estate, but on business, five years is plenty for the most part for the types of businesses that, you know, you know we're targeting. And, um, those are a lot of the similarities and differences. The other thing is on, on a business, um, back, you know, let's go back to real estate. On real estate, when you have a home on the market, you're having a hundred people call you a skip trace and you're trying to buy that home. Like, like there's so much competition to buy homes. You, you guys know. On business, it's the opposite. For every hundred businesses there are for sale, there's only one buyer. Instead of having a hundred buyers for one property, there's a hundred businesses for one buyer. So it's so much easier to make a deal happen. And that's why there's always seller finance components. That's why they're always more creative type deals because um, it's supply and demand, right? With real mm -hmm. estate, there's a, big, there's a big demand per supply and on business, it's the opposite. So that, that's a really good thing about, about business compared to, real, compared to real estate. And, Are you turning uh, those deals down? Yeah, yeah, I'll get into that for sure. Okay. Any questions, we'll get into it. The last one, the one other thing that's big difference between real estate and, and business, um, with business, with real estate, when you buy a, a property, you know, you're cash flowing three, four, five hundred, six hundred dollars a month per property, you know, especially on single families. On a business, a typical business, I'm only buying it if it's making at least six figures. So you're making at least ten thousand a month cash flow on every business you buy. And most of them are 20, 30, 40,000 a month. So you buy one business, you're cash flowing, uh, you know. 50 times what, you, what you'd cash flow on, on, a prop, on a property if you're buying a property. Um, so th those, those are some of the big differences um, on those. But as far as how do I track them down, right? That's what your question was. How do I find these businesses? Yeah. So yeah, there's, please. <laughs> <laughs> so there's many, there's many, many ways. There's many, many ways to find businesses. So um, I, I do, you know, just like in real estate, I prefer off market, right? There's always on market and off market for real estate. And it's the same thing for business. So for business, um, I 90, you know, I'm 70%, 80% going after off market businesses, which basically is every business that exists that is not for sale. And then of course you can go after businesses that are, are listed and the main website that you can find every business in your area is called biz by sell B I Z B U Y. SELL.com. If you go on Biz Buy Sell right now, you'll see over a million something businesses for sale. And you could, you could check by state, you could check by county, you could check by city, you could check by, um, you know, entertainment, food, uh, service, you know, uh, whatever it is. You can search by the type of business or you can search by the location. And you can also search by how much it makes, how much, you know, it's for sale for. You could check to see is there any owner finance, you know, um, possibilities but even if it doesn't say owner finance possibilities every business you could get owner owner finance on and again the more motivated the seller the more that they'll owner finance in the better terms that you're going to get and, and everything else but that's that's if you're going after on on market businesses now i personally only go after on market businesses um once they've been listed for 10 12 months or longer if and most most so just so you know just to put in perspective here real estate almost every property gets put on, on, on the market on the MLS sells, right? Over 97% sell. Maybe they have to lower the price or whatever, but they'll sell. Businesses that get listed on biz buy sell or online, only about seven or 8% of them sell every single year. So out of a hundred businesses that get listed, only seven or eight of them sell every year. So every year there's just more and more businesses for sale. Um, and the reason why I, I say that is because, um, I wait 10 to 12 months because there's still 98, 92% of those businesses that are still for sale. And what happens to the seller when they, when the, when the business is listed for, you know, 10 months, 12 months, two years, 
they get super motivated. Yeah. Um, there's, there's many reasons why people sell, you know, their profitable businesses, right? Um, obviously because they want to retire is probably the main one, but you know, when, when you're ready to retire, you're ready to retire. Um, and you don't have anyone to leave it to like your kids don't want it. You know, you don't have anyone to leave it to. Um, another, uh, another reason why people sell their business is because they get burned out. Sometimes they move out of state, you know, sometimes, uh, they have medical issues. They can't run it anymore. Uh, maybe they're going through a divorce or other family issues. Um, anyhow, there's literally like a couple dozen reasons why people will sell. I'm just giving you a few ideas to so people are like, well, who's going to sell a profitable business? Well, who's going to sell some real, who's going to sell a piece of real estate? For 60%, 70% of ARV, it's, it's the same difference, right? You find motivated sellers, you find right. you find the right people. So, um, but yeah, so what I do is I go out and find, um, well, before we get to, um, un, you know, businesses that are not on the market, let's finish why I wait 10. So 10, 12 months is because that's when people get super motivated and you can get really, really good deals as far as price wise. But for me, there's two things important in every single deal, whether it's, real estate or whether it's business or any other deal you do, you're buying a car, but there's price, right? The price is really important. And then the terms are really important. To me, the terms are way more important than the price. So once somebody has something listed for 10, 12 months, they get really motivated. And a lot of times they've still kind of stuck a little bit on the price, but the terms they get a lot more flexible with. And to me, that's way more important, right? So the way to put it in perspective is if you can control one or the other, there's no deal you can't make happen. If you can control either the price or the terms, I don't care what the deal is. Let me let me control one, 100%, that deal is going to happen, right? Just sure. to do an exaggerated, like, exaggerated example. Um, if you're selling your car and you want, you know, a million dollars for it and it's only worth 100000 can I buy it? Most people would say no, but you're controlling the price, right? You're controlling the price, a million dollars. Well, if I can control the terms, I could buy it. All right, it's a million bucks. Cool. I'll give you a hundred bucks a year for the next million years. You know what I mean? Like I, I could buy it for that. So sure. that's controlling the terms. And obviously, if you're like, well, I want all the money up front, that's your terms. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll give you fifty thousand for it. It's worth a hundred. You know what I mean? So I can control one or the other. I could always make something happen. Obviously, you don't control one or the other a hundred percent, but you could negotiate a little bit on both to where they're win-win situations for everybody. So that's just an example, though, of exaggerated of how, you know, if you control one or the other. So um, what you got to do in business and in real estate, you got to figure out what's important to the seller. And with with business, it's way more important because there's so many things that are important to sellers on a business that doesn't they don't care. And real estate doesn't even come to play. But we can get into those. But the thing is, is you got to figure out what's important to them. And you got to basically, that's their problem. Whatever's important to them is their problem. And you just got to solve that problem. So if, if what's important to them is the money, right? They have to get a certain amount of money. Fine. Maybe the terms aren't as important or maybe something else isn't, you know? So you, you, you go that way. A lot of times in business, some of the most important things are, you know, preserving their legacy, right? Most people. So here's the other thing about business. I'm only buying businesses that have been around for a while, right? I'm buying businesses that have been around five, 10 years plus, and they have a track record of doing really well. So that's why I'm buying them. Um, it's really stupid to start a business because 55% of businesses go out of business every single year. If you start a business within the first year, 55% of them are going to be out of business. Within yeah. 10 years, over 95% of businesses that start are out of business within 10 years. 95%. Wow. The odds are crazy. <laughs> but if you're buying a business that's already been around for that long, it's probably going to stay around forever or a long time, right? So that's why you're buying these, these types of businesses. Um, and you're buying, you know, for the cash flow and you figure out the terms and deals that you have. And again, there's not many people that are, you know, competing with you to buy these businesses. So you could really, you know, once you understand the psychology, you know, what the, the seller wants, you know, you, you make it work. So again, the most important thing for most sellers that I see is they want their legacy upheld, right? They've run this business for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. They've right. Started, but they love this business. Like, think about it. If you have a business and you know someone that has a business, they are at that business more than they're at home. So they're closer to their employees and customers, you know, than they are sometimes to their to their own kids and, and family because they're around them so much. So they really, really care about their employees particularly. And they really care about their brand, their you know, what they've built, they want, they're proud of it, right? That's what they've done their whole life. But for most people we buy businesses from have owned one business. They're not like 
people that own tons of businesses that, you know, buy and sell, buy and sell. We're going after people that have owned business for a long time and that's what they're passionate about. So um, most people will say, look, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the price you want. I'll give you the terms you want, but you got to guarantee me a few things. Okay. Well, what do you want me to guarantee you? I hear this over and over and over again. You don't fire any of my employees. You don't replace any of my employees. They, they've been with me for 10 years, 20 years, five, whatever. Like they're, you know, I, they love this business and that's what makes this business is business. And I want to make sure that, you know, they're taken care of a hundred percent. Cool. Again, I'm only buying businesses because I can keep everybody. I wouldn't even want. <laughs> so right. that's like one of the things I hear the most. The other thing I hear is look, um, I don't want you to, I don't want you to change the name of my business. Like I've built this brand over this much time. Everybody knows this is like the best, the best, whatever company in town and it has a good reputation and everybody knows that I started it and I'm proud of that. And I want that legacy to, to go on. Don't change the name. You got to guarantee me you won't change the name. Okay, fine. I don't want to change the name. Everybody, you already have a good reputation. Why would I want to change the right. name? Yeah. Um, and then, but these are the types of things that people are the most important to them, literally. Uh, and their customers and, you know, their things like that, that like in property, in real estate. Emotional things, others, right? Others don't care about if you renovate the house, if you change what it looks like. I mean, they don't care, right? But in businesses, so it's, that's, those are the big differences. And you got to understand what's important. And that's what you um, you do. And so I these sellers, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but you, what you're saying is like these sellers. They, I mean, they're all almost all like emotionally involved in that. 100%, 100%. Like like their identity is yeah. is really defined by these businesses. A lot of like entrepreneur type people. Mm -hmm. That I mean, that's their identity. That's who they are in their soul. So like, yeah, that's it's, it's got to be. Super cool. If you if you did something your whole life, you know, twenty years, thirty years, and that's what you did, or even longer. And that's yeah. what you've done your whole life. Like if someone else is taking it over, like, you're almost giving them your baby, right? Like, like how would you feel about that thing that you yeah. built over, the, over these decades, you know? Can you and tell us? Uh, oh, sorry, Malcolm, go ahead. Also, I suspect they're more realistic uh, than uh, real estate sellers um, just because they understand really the market around them. So you're pricing, if, if the market's going down, they're trying to sell it, they're not going to be, as crazy about, I need to still ha have this price. Yes. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. Everybody knows for some degree what real estate's worth. You know, it's, they could comp it easily. They could, people, people don't know what, what businesses are worth for the most part. You know, people that in the business know, but like, if you own a business, you don't know, you've never bought business, you never sold businesses. Um, it's, you just don't know. So this is a big reason why I wait 10, 12 months also before I buy something. Why? Because when you list something, what do you get? You get a broker, right? You get a broker. And there's business brokers and a business broker wants to list your property you know, wants to list your, your business because first off, business brokers get 10%, like real, real estate agents, they split 6%, a business broker split 10%. And they want, they want your listing because they, they, you know, they want to sell it. So they're going to say, look, you can get a million dollars for your business. You can get all of the money up front. You can, and they just start telling them all these lies because they want to make sure that they're the business broker that gets that listing. So what happens? When you first try to buy a business for the first six months that it's listed, and typically most business brokers have a six month agreement, right? That they're exclusive. They're, um, they're believing their broker at this point. So like when I say, look, you're listing it for a million, it's only worth a half a million. They're like, fuck you. You don't know what you're talking about. My broker told me it's worth a million. I, he's the expert and I believe him. And then when I like, all right, fine, I'll give you a million, but let's work these terms. They're like, no, my business broker said I can get all the money up front. Like, I don't believe you. So it's, it's too hard to buy these types of businesses um, when they're just listed for the first yeah. six months for sure. But even but this is what happens after eight, nine, 10 months, 12 months longer. They're like, all right, maybe my business broker lied to me. Maybe it's not worth as much. Look, <laughs> I've had this many people look at it. Nobody made me an offer. Everyone's making an offer wants some sort of terms. Everyone that's making an offer is offering this much less. At some point, they quit believing their broker. And now they start believing the other people. It's just like in a house. When you first list a house, the broker tell your real estate broker tells you you're going to get a hundred thousand for it. If you get offers for 85, 90,000, you pass on them the first few days because you're like, Oh no, I know I'm going to get more. But then like three months later when you didn't sell it, you're like, Oh shit, I should have taken that 85. You know what I mean? So it's, it's very similar. It's very similar with, with businesses, except, um, you know, businesses, it, there's a, a lot more to it. Even. Can you, uh, are you uh, willing to share a few of the businesses that you've bought and yeah. tell us a little, uh, you know, maybe an anecdote or two about some of those? Yeah, no, 100%. So first off, 
I have a YouTube channel, which is Abraham Gray, and I post awesome. at least two videos um, every single week in there. And I break down different uh, businesses I buy, how I buy them, and how I buy them for no money. Like, and these are businesses that are like making hundreds of thousands a year. And I break down how I do it because there's lots and lots of strategies. Um, so in, in real estate, you know, there's subject to, there's owner finance, there's novations, there's hybrids, there's whatever, right? In business, there's five times as many different creative ways to buy businesses because wow. there's all kinds of other stuff that does, doesn't equivalent, you know, doesn't equate to, to real estate, but it equates to business, right? There might be tons of different, uh, anyhow, there's a lot of different ways basically to buy businesses creatively. So every single business I buy, no two are exactly the same. I take like one or two or three things, you know, that I use and use them over and over, but then there's like three or four new things that's different in every business too. So I, I mix and match, but um, so on, uh, on one business here, so, so I have this business Marietta trophy, but by the way, my office, I have like a hundred different businesses I, I've owned. Or, <clears throat> or, or, yeah. Like, all over. Love like, it. These are all different businesses. They're just all over. But anyway, um, so this Marietta trophy here, this is a trophy store I bought like, uh, three, four years ago now. I made a YouTube video about this one, but I've made it about other ones. I'm going to keep making them about every single one if you want to see how I did it. But this particular one was one that was exactly like we talked about. So the owner of this business put it on the market because they were going through a divorce. Like he wasn't that old. He was, you know, um, not much older than me. Like he was just a little bit older than me. Right. But he was going to, but he owned this business for 20 years and he was going through a divorce and he couldn't think his wife and him couldn't figure out how to how to how to figure out the value of this business and when they were getting divorced like she was like oh no this business is worth a million he's like no this business is worth half a million and um you know she's like if you and he's like look if you think it's worth a million fine you take it and i'm getting a million dollars worth of other stuff you know and she's like well i can't run this business you've always run it. i don't know anything about this business i can't take it and he's like well it's not worth a million it's worth a half a million and she's like no it's worth more and so the only way they were able to figure out what it's really worth is to sell it Right. That's the only way. And she was stuck on wanting this, this high value for it. And, um, and he didn't want to sell it for that low either because, you know, it, he's been running it for decades. Right. So he was, so he was asking, so he had, he had the business and he actually owned a uh, property with the business. So he had real estate, a commercial real estate and the business. And he was asking $1.2 million for the real estate and the business together. That's what he was asking. It was on the market. This was the on market one. And this one's been on the, most of the ones I bought were off market. This particular one's on market, but it's been, on the, it was on the market for close to a year. Like I tell you, I wait, you know, 10 months a year and he's had lots of offer. He had lots of people look at it, but nobody could get to his 1.2 million. It was just way too much. Mm -hmm. So his business was making a little bit over 200,000 a year in profit. Like he was, that was his take home after all expenses. He was making around 200,000 a year. And so I went in there. I'm like, all right, I want to pay two to three times. I'm thinking it's worth, you know, 400 to 600 on the high side. And, uh, and then he had this property that probably hundred percent ARV is like 400 grand. So add 400 grand to it because it's the property I, I always do separate. So I, I want to pay somewhere between 400 and 600. I'm always going to shoot on the low side. So I'm like 400 plus 400. If the building was worth 400. I wanted to pay, you know, 300 and something. So I was at like 700,000 is what I offered the guy or 700, 750. And uh, he's like, no, I need 1.2 million. He was stuck on 1.2 million. I kept going back, kept going back. I was like, I'll tell you what, I can get you your 1.2 million. I was the only person out of everyone that looked at his business that said, look, I, I'll give you the 1.2 million. I said, fine, I'm fine giving you the 1.2 million, but you know, we've got to figure out the terms of how I'm going to get it to you. you know? And I was like, how much money do you need up front? And he was like, well, you know, I want... Uh, you know, he wanted like 500,000 up front. He's like, I'll finance the other 700,000. So I was like, all right, cool. He's already willing to finance over half of it. You know, we we're already close. Um, and again, every business that I'm buying now, for the most part, I really don't want to use any of my money or very, very little. So obviously I, I still have to come up with 500,000, which I don't want to come up with that much. Wood, much you know, it's just too much money to come up with because I want to buy tons of businesses and eventually you run out. Right. So um, plus I want to be able to buy businesses and show everybody how they can do it not having money, right? Even if I have it and I could use it, I don't want to. So um, I was like, all right, I knew we were close. I knew we, we had something cooking. 
So um, I said, look, let me give you um, 300,000 up front and then the other 900,000, um, you know, uh, over some amount of time, which we're, we'll talk about. And we ended up negotiating it to where he was like, I'll do 400,000 up front and 800,000 over time. And uh, so I was like, all right, cool. I think I can make that work. But here's the story. Um, if I'm paying you 1.2 million, I need that 800,000 to be over 20 years. Or I actually said even higher, 25 years. He's like, well, I can't do 25 years, but I can do 10 years. And I was like, well, I could do 10 years, but if I do 10 years, I only need you a million. If you want 1.2, I got to do 25. And we ended up going back and forth. And he's like, you know what? I, I need the 1.2. I don't know why he wanted that 1.2, but like he was stuck. Like literally, like he wouldn't take a dollar less. We agreed on a 20-year deal um, at 1.2. So I have to give him 400,000 up front, 800,000. I actually owe him now. It's been four years. I owe him for another 16 years. So, um, and I'm, I'm giving him 5% interest on it. So that's, he wanted a higher interest. We went back and forth. We agreed on 5%. So here, here's the thing. I'll break down everything after, but how did I come up with the 400,000, right? Because I still don't, I still don't use any of my money. So what I did was I separated the, the business and the real estate. And I got, I went to the bank and I said, look, I'm buying this business. I need to get a loan on this, on this building. Uh, how much can you give me a loan for? And I went to like a couple of my banks, Chase, Bank of America, whatever. And they're like, we can give you an 80% loan of the appraisal. They, we had it appraised, it appraised about 400,000. And they said, look, we'll give you 320,000, um, a loan for 320,000. I was like, all right, cool. So now I still got to come up with 80 more thousand. So um, I, always, I always have like a ton of people come to me and they're like, oh, I want to do business with you. I want to, you know, be partners with you. I want to, you know, get involved, you know. So, so, I, so one of the people um, that always was bugging me at the time, I was like, you know what? I have this great business I'm about to buy. Um, I'm paying, you know, 1.2 million, 800,000 for the business, 400,000. For the building, but honestly, I don't think the business is worth eight hundred thousand. I think um, I think the business is worth you know a little bit less. But um, if you want, what I'll do is I'll sell you. Uh, I said what I want to pay, what I think is fair to pay for the business, and like a really good deal is eight hundred thousand. I think eight hundred thousand is a great deal for the business and the property together, right? I'm paying one point two, but you know I'm getting some sort of owner financing, so whatever. If you want. I will sell you 10% of this business and building, right? The, the deal I'm buying for what I think it's worth, a great deal, 800,000. He's like, done. So he gave me 80,000 bucks for 10% of the business. So now I took that 80,000, I took the 320 from the bank and I, I paid the guy at closing 400,000 and I have 800,000 alone. So I came with zero of my own, own money. The business was cash flowing 200 grand. I mean, um, yeah, cash flowing 17,000 a month. That's how much it was making for the last multiple years. It was consistently 17,000 a month. So it uh, makes 17 G's a month. Uh, yeah. That's after all expenses and debt and all everything. Time. After rent, after utilities, after buying the product, after paying the employees, after everything, after paying rent, everything, 17,000. So, mm -hmm. um, so basically my payments to him right now are like 4,500 a month. So I'm paying him 4,500 a month. So I basically am taking home, and it still stayed at, at seventeen thousand. Um, so you know, I'm basically taking home twelve thousand five hundred, thirteen thousand every single month, um, mm -hmm. putting no money up front. Every single month, I, I'm still I'm taking that money every month. Now I have to give that partner ten percent every month because he's ten percent. So out of that thirteen thousand, I'm giving him thirteen hundred. I'm taking you know eleven five twelve every single month. I, I came up with zero dollars on my pocket. I have this great business. I've actually started growing it, so it's making more money now. And then I made a deal with, with the guy that I sold that, that gave me the money. I actually bought him out like a year later and I used the profit that I made to buy him out. So now, now I own a hundred percent of the business again, but I didn't have to come up with any money to buy him out because I used the profit that I made over that year, you know, to pay yeah. him. So, um, <laughs> now for these businesses, do you, use them? and I gave, and I gave him a return on his a good return on his money, you know? Do yeah. You, he was making team. like, oh, what was he, what did it look like for him? Like uh, just to even be partners with you was a good deal. Right. I mean, that yeah, yeah. he was getting a good return on that and that's awesome. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And as a friend of mine, he lived out of state and um, he learned a lot and you know, now we're doing stuff, you know, where he's at. So we've actually bought some businesses where he's at and, and he's running them and I'm doing stuff with him there, but I have business partners in probably at least six or eight different States right now that I do stuff with. What do, do you, you look for in a partner? I look for someone that is 
is good at the stuff I'm not good at, or okay. or even if even if um even if he's not good at this, I, someone that enjoys doing this stuff, I don't enjoy doing. Right? Sure. There's certain things in a business that I really like to do, and there's really a lot of things I don't like to do. So the stuff I don't like to do, I find people that like to do it or or want to do it, and that's 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 basically. Um, but it's usually the people that are good at the stuff I'm not good at because typically you like doing what you're good at and you don't like doing what you're not good at typically. Exactly. So, yeah. um, so that's kind of where So most of my partners are not good at what I'm good at, but I'm not good at any of the stuff my partners are good at. So it, it works really, it works really well. Like you guys know, obviously Cody and Paige, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they're totally opposite. So it's just like my partnerships, right? Uh, Pace is the one that likes doing the, you know, negotiating, the talking, the, all that. And then Cody's the one that's behind the scenes that does all the integrator stuff. I, I hate the integrator stuff. I suck at it. I couldn't do it like for anything. Um, but the stuff Pace does, that's, that's what I like to do. So like sure. it's the same with, with my partners. And it doesn't matter if you're good, which one you're good at, which one you just got to find someone that's good or likes doing the other stuff. That's awesome. That's now, cool. I, I, really I, oh, I wanted to ask a question here real quick. Um, yeah. When you're when you're in the the thick of these businesses, um, do you and you're buying these established businesses, and um, obviously marketing has to to do with the, you know, a business like this, a trophy business, being able to continue. I mean, they've been probably marketing word of mouth for years, but they probably have some sort of marketing in place too. Do you um, just continue whatever marketing they have, or do you do your own marketing in addition? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So this is the awesome thing about this one. Um, when you buy a business, you're always going to be able to do as good as they're doing for the most part, right? Because you're not buying a business that the owner was, was, you know, very important to that business. It, you know, you got to buy a business that when the owner leaves, it's not going to hurt the business. So you buy one that has all these people in place. So whatever they've done that works, you're going to keep doing. But most businesses, especially the ones that we're buying, are, are, we're buying them from people that are in the retirement age and they don't even understand all the new, you know, the new marketing stuff that really works. So typically when you buy a business, you're either going to stay the same or you're going to get a lot better by adding new marketing that, that they don't even know how to do. So this particular guy did very little marketing. He just had word of mouth. He has the same customers that always spend a lot of money every single, every single month. They have, you know, different businesses that buy awards for all their employees, different, you know, basketball leagues that buy all their trophies, all baseball. And, but they have like tons of businesses that just buy consistently and then they have some walk-in. But, um, so we went out, yeah, and, and started doing a little bit of new marketing. So that's why we got better. I actually grew the business, you know, a, a lot more and, and it's doing a lot better now. And uh, different strategies I use that I teach also. Um, so the one big strategy that I use uh, to buy businesses is called bolt-ons. And bolt-ons are when you own a business and you want to grow it, but you don't want to spend a whole lot of money like on marketing or anything else because it just takes so long to, to grow it, right? When you market, you grow a little bit at a time. A bolt-on is when you go buy a competitor or a similar business, you just buy their business, and then you add it to your business, and now you like you go 50% up like overnight. So that, yeah. that, that's what I do in a lot of businesses. So a lot of businesses I buy are ones that complement or are very similar or almost the same as my own business. So that, that's one way I grew this. I actually bought a couple trophy stores since then, um, and I'm actually in the process of talking with a couple now. I think I'm going to buy another one within the next month or so. And uh, instantly, I you know I'm making an extra hundred plus thousand a year um, because uh, you know the, when you bolt on, you could get rid of uh, a lot of the expenses, and um, you know you keep all the the profits, but you get rid of the expenses, and then you know you're able to buy in bigger bulk. You're allowed to do different things, so you, you get better pricing, and you know I get to see all his his best vendors, my best vendors, and then you know be able to renegotiate between them. But there's all kinds of stuff you can do, and then um, obviously if Sometimes you can share employees, so you don't need to, you know, double your accounting bills. You don't need to double your legal bills. You know, you know, all kinds of stuff. Sometimes, if it's not like a really good business standalone, you could merge it into your business and get rid of the rent, get rid of some employees potentially, depending on the business you're buying. I bought um, a lot of gyms in the past where they were not doing well. so. I remember I told you I only look for profitable businesses, right? Yeah. So there's a few exceptions. There's three exceptions of why you would want to buy a business that is not profitable. Um, and the biggest one is really to get a bolt on to where you could just take their customers, maybe take their employees, maybe take their equipment and add it to your existing business. Right. So if you didn't have an existing business, you would never want to do that because you couldn't like make all the savings, but I will take a business. I'll buy a business. Right? I have some gym. I have like 10 gyms, right. Um, martial arts gyms and stuff. And, um, I have gyms that were close by my gyms. They're very similar, 
that weren't doing well and they needed to sell. And no one would buy the business because it's not making money or making very little or losing a little bit. No one would buy it. It's, it's, it's insane. So I went in and bought it um, and I was able to pay more than anybody else. Well, no one would probably pay almost anything because I was able to, their customers are worth a lot of money to me. Like mm. the gyms that I have are, you know, there's coaches and, and we, we charge like 170 bucks a month. And a lot of these gyms were charging 120, 150, 170, whatever. I was able to take their customers and just move, merge them into my gym and it didn't really cost anything. I already had the coaches. I didn't have to pay more coaches. I already had the rent. I didn't have to pay more rent. I didn't, there was nothing I had to pay. I just got their, their customers. So um, I always figure there's going to be a decent amount of customers that don't want to switch over. But the ones that do, the members that switch over, you make so much money on. So mm. when I'm able to buy a business that's, that's not doing well, you can buy it for pennies on the dollar a lot of times. Um, and then on top of that, they had a lot of equipment that I was able to use. And then the equipment that they had that I couldn't use, I was able to sell it and basically get a lot of the money that I paid the guy just off the equipment I didn't even want anymore. So, I mean, I got all these members and I still have members from like gyms I bought five years ago that are coming, that are paying $170 a month for years. So, um, you know, think about how much that's worth. So that's one reason why you'd buy a business that's not doing well is because you could make money by merging yours. Another reason uh, people would buy a business that's not doing well is because they could li liquidate everything. Um, they could go in there and be like, look, all this equipment, all this, all these different things, I could buy it and, you know, I'm paying you 50 cents on a dollar for it. I could get 80 cents on a dollar and they can make it. <laughs> that would be another, that's a lot of work. I don't like doing that, but that's another reason why you could buy. And then people might ask, well, why didn't the person selling it just sell it for 80 cents on a dollar? Well, again, they had this business, they're losing money. They, emotionally, they just don't want to see that business anymore. It's like, it's like stressful for them. It's like depressing. So they just want to get out of there as fast as possible. And um, sometimes they'll sell it for way less than it's worth because they don't want to have to deal with it, right? It's not worth it to them emotionally. So they'll sell something and then, you know, you make the money on it. Or maybe you have connections of how to sell it where they don't know how. Maybe they don't even know what Craigslist is or Facebook Marketplace or whatever. And you know how to use it. You know, a lot of people don't know how to sell stuff. So um, that is a reason why, another reason why you could buy, but you'd buy it basically just based on what the equipment's worth and what you could sell it for and a percentage of that. Um, yeah, and, then, okay. and, then, and then lastly, another reason, the last reason why somebody would buy a business that is not doing well or not making money is because they are an expert in that field and they think that they have the knowledge or skills to be able to take that business and turn it around. That's a lot of work and I don't like doing that either. So I very rarely do it to liquidate and I very rarely do it to buy the turnaround. But some people do. I, I don't like suggest that to most people because it's a lot of work and if you're really, there's people out there that that's all they do. And they're really, really good at that. And, and for them, it makes sense because that's what they do. But um, if it's not something you do all the time, I, I would only buy profitable businesses or businesses that you can merge into businesses you already have. But those are just a, a few, a few examples. Obviously when it comes to business, I could talk for months and not even go through everything. I actually do. <laughs> I actually do um, uh, multiple business masterminds every, every single year. They're like three days, 10 hours a day. And then after the 10 hours we go out, and have fun and network and go to different activities. But um, we go through everything from A to Z in, in those. And uh, it's really fun. And it opens people's minds up to what you can do because no one teaches business. There's nobody out there that teaches business. Um, you don't learn it in school. You don't learn it anything. People don't even know you can buy businesses. People don't know you can sell businesses. People don't know how to value them. People don't know how to negotiate them. You know, what's important to the seller, um, you know, how to work the terms. Nobody knows this stuff. It's like, it's like, there's thousands of people that teach real estate. There's on a, literally you can count the many people that teach business on a hand and uh, most of them don't know what they're doing. So there is one person that I'm really good friends with that like the first person that ever taught, you know, how to buy businesses creatively without using your money and how to grow them and how to do all these different things. And uh, he has a mentorship and I actually joined his mentorship. Like when he first started it, you know, years and years ago and became friends and the masterminds I do now, I actually became partners with him and we actually do these masterminds together but um he he had this mentorship forever and it's just like pace's mentorship but it's not it's not for creative you know real estate it's for creative business buying wow. and he has 10 11 000 people that he's he's has in his mentorship and it's crazy you know it's, it's you know if you're in the facebook group you can see how every single month there's lots of people buying these businesses and again when you're buying a business you're making 10 20 30 000 a month cash flow and um you know you know i teach you and he'll teach you how to do it without being hands-on. Like I own dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses right now. I haven't been to 90% of them in two or three years. 
So oh. I just get a check every single month. Yeah. yeah. So do you? You could do it totally hands off. Yeah. That's all. Do you focus on? I mean, there's a lot of uh, website and virtual business and all the rest. Do you phys- do you focus on physical types of business? What's your focus on the the characteristics of the business? Because you're um, you're talking about being able to liquidate um, things and or whether it comes with property. Where, where's your focus with things like that? I mean, I'm, I'm looking for. I honestly start by looking at for profitable businesses in the in, in the industries that I'm, I'm most interested in. And a lot of the industries I'm most interested in, you know, might be totally different for other people. But I, that's how I start. I look for, I figure out the industries that I want to look at. And then I figure out making sure they're making a certain amount of money. And then I figure out, um, you know, do they have a team in place? And then I figure out how motivated they are. And then, you know, I just go from there. But um, I don't go after businesses to try to liquidate them. But if I did, I would make sure that they had, you know, a decent amount of assets. And again, you look at the, you look at the balance sheet and you'll see what they, what they have. So like, um, the first step, the first step to doing a deal with somebody to buy their business is you you talk to them the first time, a lot of times on the phone, and the first time, and you just make sure that you're somewhat on the same page. You just get to know each other and what the needs are, and then you basically at that point at the end of that conversation, you want to say, look, I need to you know to figure out what your, I think your business is worth. I need to see your numbers. I need to see your P and Ls, your profit and loss statement. I need to see your financials, your balance sheet, all that stuff. And you're like, look. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, saying that I, I, as soon as I see it, no one else is going to see it besides me. I'm going to sign that you know it's confidential, and the only people that I can show it to is my attorney and my accountant, but nobody else. And they only care, really, honestly, that you don't show it to their competitors, you don't show it to their employees, you don't show it to their customers, right? That's what they yeah. don't. Do. That's what they don't want to see it. But um, so at the end of the conversation, I get them comfortable. We we. Um, I sign an NDA and then I go through their numbers and then we, we kind of go through scenarios of, of what will work. You know, I get to know their business. I get to know them. Um, buying a business is, is very much a, a rapport business. Like you have to build really, really good rapport with the seller. When, you, when you're buying uh, real estate, you want to ha- you should have good rapport with, with the seller as well. But it's not as important as with the business um, because they're so more emotionally attached to it and because there's so many more things they care about. That you have to, they have to really like you. No, would you let would you let someone babysit your your kid if you didn't like them, mm-hmm. and you didn't trust them? You would never would, right? This is their kid. So not only are you babysitting it, you're taking it out, you're adopting it. You know, so yeah. like you have to get them so comfortable with you. You have to get them to love you, to like trust you, respect you, and and see that you have the same vision as that they have for their business. And um, that's what I do the first call that I have with them, and then. Usually the second time I see them in person and a lot of times it's at their business or somewhere else. And I really, really focus on rapport, rapport, rapport. The first one or two times I, I focus on it every time, but the first one or two times they have to like you. If they don't like you, you you're never going to get a deal done and you're never going to get a good deal done. So that's the most do important. Do you want to like them or is it just trust because you, you're taking them on as partners? So, I mean, they're not partners. Uh, you, you're, you're buying them out. Well, what what I mean by partners is if you were saying, uh, you, if you're looking to do a, a sub two of their business as such, they're going to be in the background, and you're going to want their information. You're going to want uh, to know uh, things about their business in the future and have them invested. Uh, so, and not not as a partner per se. But- I, I know what you're saying. So here's the thing. That's another big big reason. A big big reason why you do owner finance. A big big reason. So, besides the fact that you want their knowledge. If they lied to you or screwed you or, or tricked you, you own so much money, you put it in the agreement that if you lied to me, you tricked me on these, these numbers, you're going to lose all this money I owe you. So wow. yeah. um, that's another reason why you make them owe you money for like three, five years, because they, 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 they shouldn't be able to trick you. But here's the thing. We do a ton of due diligence and I go through all the different due diligence you have to do and how to do it and to, and to dot your I's and your T's and to make sure you don't get screwed. But no matter how much due diligence you do, there's always going to be stuff that there's no way to know 100%. So, um, so by them owner financing a certain amount, besides the fact they have to help you, they, it, it makes them not want to screw you or not try to screw you because they know that you're going to get it back because you're not going to pay them. Well, fantastic. <laughs> now, um, you were telling us earlier that you buy a lot of your property or a lot of your businesses, you end up buying them. Um, off market 
and the, and you were talking about how important wow. it is to um, to talk to the seller when you're buying something on market. Do you usually have to go through the broker before you can get to the seller, or can yeah. you? Or sometimes you don't even get to the seller. So here's the thing: it's just like real estate. Like if someone has a broker, you almost have to go through the broker. But here's the thing: I have a really good broker that I deal with exclusively when I'm trying to buy something, and um, my broker tells the other broker, "Look, if you want this deal to happen." Let my client talk to your client directly because he knows how to make these deals. He's done tons. And he's going to make it. If we have to go through each other, it's just going to potentially kill the deal. So I usually get to talk to the people, um, especially you know pretty soon. However, most people don't. It's hard. And the most important thing with buying a business is rapport. So when you're going through brokers, that's another reason why I don't like on-market businesses because the rapport is a lot harder to get that rapport going. Um, so, but yes. But as far as the other thing we never touched is how do I buy off-market property, yes. uh, off-market um, businesses, right? Good question. Um, yes. So there's a lot, of, a lot, a lot, a lot of ways. Um, I love, um, you know, just doing a research. A lot of times I'll just go to Google and search for every single whatever business in whatever areas I'm looking for. I'll make a spreadsheet or I'll have my VA or assistant make a spreadsheet for me. They'll put down the business, the address, their phone number, the owner's name, everything I want to know. And then um, what I'll do is I'll either send everybody letters and I have crazy ways to send letters to people that really um, I came up with that no one in the world does. Um, and uh, that really gets their attention. It really gets them to call me. And then I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn, you can reach every single CEO. You can reach all the HR managers. You can reach anyone. on this. So LinkedIn is a big one. Um, again, posting just on any social media, letting people know, look, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking to buy these types of businesses. Do you know anyone? Do you have anyone? I go talk to um, you know my you know my accountants and my attorneys and say, look, do you know anyone that you know, or my wealth managers? Do you have anyone that you're you know managing their business or you know other people that are managing that are looking to sell it or looking to retire? And you just you know you you network like that. There's different events you can go to that um, show like people that are selling different different businesses. Um, uh, there's Facebook groups that are out there that if you're looking for you know HVAC companies, there's tons of HVAC uh, Facebook groups. And you go on there and you can see people in every state, any city, wherever, and what they're, you know, some people are trying to buy businesses. Some are trying to sell them. Some are trying to, you know, buy inventory or buy, you know, whatever. So um, there's just so many, so many different ways like that to do it. Um, and, and, and again, uh, I could go on and really talk about this for a long time, but I don't think we have enough time. But those are some of the big ways that I do it, you know, right, right off the bat. And uh, with letters, if anyone has ever seen my letters, they would shock me. I don't know if I have any in my office, but um, what I do is, you know, the thing about a letter is get people's attention, get them to open it, get them to read it and get them to set. So, you know, my letters are crazy. Like if I'm buying, uh, when I was buying a whole bunch of gyms, my letters look like a barbell. They're shaped like a barbell. They were shaped like, um, and I send them out and people would get a barbell in the mail and be like, what the hell? They're curious. They open it. And then once they open it, I have you know, special things in there that get them to read it. And then once they read it, I say special things in there that get them to want to call me and, you know, so on and so forth. But again, we can't get into all that, but um, th those are just, you got to be super creative. And people are always like, well, look, if you're not talking to them, you can't build rapport with them. And rapport is the most important thing. That's not true. You can build rapport by sending email. Oh, I do a lot of emails too. So I have an email, um, a whole email campaign that works. And by the way, something cra crazy, I can't get into everything because not of time, but um, one thing I do is um, everyone here gets a million spam emails all the time, right? Um, you ever get a spam email and you're like, wait a second, that, that title is kind of interesting. You kind of open it and you're like, oh shit, and then you delete it or something. <laughs> yeah. So every, single, every single month or two, I get like one email or two emails that trick me. I'm like, oh fuck, I opened it. You know what I mean? Like it was total junk, but it was just, it made me curious. So what do I do? Every time I get an email that makes me open it, I have a spreadsheet of every single email I open, and I, ha I literally have a hundred different different um, um, headlines of emails that I've opened, and mm -hmm. uh, I just use those over and over with other people, and they open my emails because I open it. And if you trick me to open it, I'm gonna trick everybody else in opening it. And it's not really a trick, but once you open it, then I have some other cool shit that make me. So um, if you ever open shit, you know, spam emails, and because the title is so good, save those titles. But anyhow, that's just a little, a little side trick. But um, you can do that with real estate. You can do that with anything. But I, the business is what I use it for. Um, I can't go through all my tricks because not enough time. But if you come to, uh, if you ever uh, come to an event or something, we, we go through it in, in detail. For sure, that sounds awesome. 
Man, about that sounds creative. amazing. All about being creative. And follow we've, my YouTube. Follow my, follow my YouTube, Abraham Gray. Yes. G -R -E -Y. And let me let yeah. me put that up on the screen again for folks too. Um, here you go. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to be, um, I liked and subscribed and then hit the bell icon as well. I want to make sure yeah. I get everything. It was amazing. Abraham, it's been so wonderful to have you on the show with us today. It, um, teaching us all this amazing knowledge. Um, um, we, we love to, you know, stay with you for, you know, a few more minutes, if you're willing to tell us some more, but, um, you know, if you have, if you have any questions, I, I want to give me some questions and we'll, we'll go through it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Well, I've got some questions from the, from the folks watching. Uh, Joel asks, he says, um, uh, how do you care? Uh, here, let me pop that up. Um, how do you um, take care of managing the business and adding value to it, especially if you are newer to it? No. Oh, so that's a great question. So again, one of the three most important things when I buy a business is to make sure there's a management team in place. I almost, have turned down some really good businesses because the owner did most of the management and I didn't have someone to fill their place. So I couldn't buy, it. even though it was a great business, I literally had to turn the business down because it didn't have management place. So that's one of the most important things. So um, I go and after I buy the business, I talk to the high level people, the managers, everybody else and ask them, if you own this business, what would you do? And I'd say, and I asked the same thing to the owner that I bought it from. I'm like, look, I know you had this business forever, but what would you have done? What did you want to do that you didn't do? And I get a list of all the different things that they would have done. And then I talk to all the managers and I get them their, their feedback. And then we go through it and I decide, okay, what makes sense to do what, what doesn't make sense to do. There's always a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense. And there's always a few things that make sense. And it's very important to listen to them and do some of the stuff that they tell you because then they're like, oh, wow, he really values me. He really cares. And, you know, we're going to work good together. So I always ask them, what would they do? And I always pick at least one thing, if not multiple things that they tell me. And I'm like, look, I'm doing it because you told me I have total faith in you. You're, you're in charge. And that just makes them want to do good. And like, Oh, wow. You know, so that is one thing that I do. Um, and then of course on the business, you know, if you know anything about business, you had anything about, uh, if you had any other businesses or even real estate, you know, you have your own marketing strategies and everybody has different marketing strategies. And, you know, um, whatever they have that works, I'm going to keep, and then I'm going to add all my marketing strategies that they don't do. And that's going to help grow the business. Now, mm -hmm. um, I typically have partners in most of my businesses. We didn't even get into partners, but most of my businesses I have a partner and I am the one that finds the business, negotiates the business, determines if it's, you know, a good price, good terms, all that. My partner is the one that operates it. So as soon as I buy it and I talk to the to the manager, whoever's going to be in charge, my partner is now their boss. And um, he's going to implement how we operate all the other businesses into that particular business. And um, we're going to take all the good stuff we do out of every business and figure out what makes sense to do for that business and implement it. So your partner would be like a, a, an integrator and you're the vision. Yes, 100%. I, su I suck at integrating. I don't have patience. <laughs> um, I, everything would fail. <laughs> I just don't enjoy yeah. it. I don't enjoy it. Yeah, that's a that's a key relationship right there. You got to find somebody to run that can make the trains run on time. If you're somebody right. who's you know got a more, um, I you know I'm trying to think of another word besides visionary, but it's just yeah. such the appropriate well, word. Look, for I, I could buy every single business and I could do it all, but like I can't run it, so the business is worthless. And my partner. He can't, he can't find, he doesn't know how to find the business. He doesn't know how to negotiate. He doesn't know how to comp them if you want or to care about it. Huh? Yeah. It's just, just not his thing. So like he would never do good if I wasn't finding businesses and I would never do good if he wasn't you know, able to operate them. So without having both of us, we wouldn't be able to do anything. You know? Is, yeah. your, is your partner keeping track of everything you're, you're doing as well? I mean, yeah. as an integrator. So he has um, your lead management because it's like, you seem to be, you must be looking at an enormous number of businesses and trying to keep track of what's an opportunity or not. He, he, so he, know, he knows high level what I do and I know high level what he does, but intricacies, he doesn't know how I do it and he doesn't understand it. And at intricacies, I don't really understand. I don't know and see everything he does, but you know, I have different partners in different businesses, but we, you know, we've known each other, we've built relationships, we trust each other and, and, and it works. But um, yeah, if, 
Could I run a business? Can I operate it? Can I find it? Yeah, I probably could. You know, I, I did when I started, you know, when I was in my teens and early 20s, I ran and did everything, you know. But what happened was I was able to have one business, two businesses, maybe three businesses. And I couldn't do anymore because I do everything. So instead of having two, three businesses making, you know, 100,000 a year, now I could have 50 businesses or 100 businesses and maybe only own half or a third. But, you know, I'm making, 10, you know, 100 times the amount, only doing the stuff I enjoy doing, only doing the stuff I like. So it's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You got to have you out there doing that work to, or you won't get the next great deal so <laughs> yeah and and you know some people some people don't want partners and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that some people want partners and there's nothing wrong with that like i know people that would never, wouldn't have a partner for anything and, and that's okay they do well but you know you can only grow so much you know without having any partners but again if you don't have partners if you have really really good key employees then that that could make up for for a lot of not having partners but uh, for me it, it always worked i actually have like a whole training just on partners all i talk about is partners how to protect yourself, how to find them, how to do everything that you could possibly want to know about partner. I probably know more than anybody in this world because I've had probably a hundred partners at this point. So, um, and you know, I've, I've had good ones, bad ones. I've had problems. I've had, you know, stuff go well. So I, I have a whole business, I have a whole partner training, but yeah. So I, partners is a big thing for me. Awesome. Hey, can we find that on your, on the YouTube? The, I actually uh, made, I actually just made a YouTube video on partners. I might even have, I have two different, I have two different videos on YouTube on partners. One is how to protect yourself against partners. So I've had so many problems over the last 30 years with partners that every single time I have a problem, I write down what the problem is. And now I have my attorney figure out a solution to where when I have a partner next time, I can't, that problem can't happen. So I made a whole video on how to protect yourself. And it's literally like any problem you can have, how to protect yourself and how to protect your partner. And, you know, every type of thing that can come up, I pretty much almost run into. And uh, so we protect ourselves. And I made a, a one, one YouTube video, just how to protect yourself with partners. And then I made another YouTube video months ago, how to find partners and, you know, how to tell if it's the right partner for you and stuff like that. So I, have, I think I have two YouTube videos on partners. Love it. Love it. Um, Joel also asks, he says, uh, what are the types of businesses uh, you're invested in or buying? Um, and then um, now we know you already talked about that. We know you got a uh, gyms and, and yeah. trophy. So I, have, I have businesses, all kinds of businesses. I, I really look for profitable businesses at this point. Like when you're first starting, you should really only target businesses that, you know, something that you're knowledgeable in, something you've done before, something that you really enjoy something that you know someone that, that, that does that could help you, that's what you should target. But once you get really good at business in general, then it just doesn't matter, right? Then you can kind of go after everything. So really, really right now, I, um, I go after any type of business. It's just got to be profitable and have someone that runs it and have a motivated seller. Those are the three things that it has to have. Once it has those, I go after everything. But what type of businesses do I have? I own you know, a whole bunch of gyms. I own CrossFit gyms, martial art gyms. I, um, I have some ice cream stores. I have tons of art. I have tons of entertainment. So I have arts and craft studios. I have axe throwing locations, Bury the Hatchet. I have um, escape rooms. Um, I have Putt Nation. I have uh, mini golf, like really high tech mini golf with like kitchen and bar, um, full kitchen and bar. I have uh, some oil change places, that's Take Five. I bought, I own two franchises. I have two franchises. One is a Take Five oil change, which was in South Florida and uh, West Palm Beach area. And, um, and then I own uh, um, another franchise. I own a Homevesker franchise. Um, that's the other franchise I own in Atlanta. Although there's like 30 different people that own franchises here. Um, I own uh, a few trophy stores. I own um, uh, some online like uh, businesses where you help people grow their business, like ad, ad type agencies. Uh, I have a media company where I help people make videos and, um, you know, shorts and long videos for like their social media and for YouTube and, and all that. Um, I have, uh, let's see what else. I mean, just, just uh, re really, as you see, it's just stuff in every industry. I'm not like particular about what, what it is, but I have like a, a cleaning service. I had, I have, you know, different um, uh, real estate stuff where I have like uh, a whole bunch of crews that like do work for, uh, for myself. But then when I, when I don't need them, I have them do work and we bid on other people's jobs. And I, I do some of that. Um, gray method. Um, that's where I do, um, I do, uh, like three or four times a year. I'll do, 
a, a big mastermind and I teach people about business. How, everything we're talking about, I teach people how to do it all. So I do that a few times, a few times a year. My next one's in Tampa, uh, the last the last weekend in February in Tampa. So I do that. Um, again, just different entertainment stuff, different real estate stuff. Um, but re really, I, I, there's nothing I wouldn't do. You know, it, it's um, if it makes money, it's legal. You know, I, I would do it. I, lo I love entertainment business right now. Right now, I have like three or four new concepts that I'm, I'm about to try over the next year or so that like don't exist. And um, that's how I've made most of my money, doing stuff that like I'm first to market, doesn't exist. And the way I do this is I, I, I Google search and I look for businesses in other cities, other countries, other states that do really, really well, but are only in that one area. And mm -hmm. I, sometimes, you know, I just, they have a booking platform where I can see how busy they are. Or sometimes I'll fly there and spend, spend a couple of days and, and go through the experience and see how busy it really is on the weekdays, on the weekends, talk to some of the employees. And then when I see they have some really cool businesses um, that I think are gonna make a lot of money, I bring them to, to me, I bring them to Atlanta, I bring them to all these other cities that I have partners in that I do a lot of stuff. I do a lot of stuff in Atlanta, I do a lot of stuff in Florida, I do a lot of stuff in uh, New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, in, uh, in New York, you know, uh, Texas, I, I used to do a lot of stuff. In California, I've done a lot of stuff. Um, Kansas, Alabama, Tennessee, you know, Chicago, I, I've done a ton of stuff. You know, Kansas, I have some businesses in right now. Um, it, just, it just depends. You know, but I have partners in all these different states that I can do stuff with. And, um, you know, a lot of times in my masterminds, um, after the mastermind, like, I get really close with some of the people that came, and we become partners on a lot of businesses. So, I, you know, I get more, more people that I can do stuff with in other, other cities and states that help. Love hey, that. I've got, to, I've got to ask uh, something that I will regret if I don't. What is your exit strategies? I mean, are you buy and hold, or are you flip, or is it a variety? Uh, so, I mean, when it comes to business, so when I when I buy businesses, my exit strategy is just to keep it to cash flow as long as it as long as it can. I don't ever buy them, trying to sell them. However, there are some people that do that, and I can tell you about them even in sub two that have come to some of my masterminds that have made crazy money just basically wholesaling businesses, right? They don't even own it. Yeah. But but no, my, my strategy is to buy them and just, I, I, I'm buying the cash flow. I'm buying the cash flow. And then I never have an exit strategy. However, at some point I'm like, you know what? I don't enjoy this business anymore. If I don't enjoy it anymore, then I, then I want to sell it. If I see that the trend is not going the way I want, then maybe I'll try to sell it. And people ask me all the time, it's a, you know, it's a good question you ask me, well, when you sell businesses, do you give people owner finance? Do you give people terms? And my answer is, if it's something I'm motivated to sell because I don't like it anymore, I'll give them the best terms and the best price possible. If it's something I don't really want to sell, I want all my money up front. I'm going to want more than it's probably worth, right? It's, it's, it's all about going back to finding motivated sellers. If, if you find a motivated seller, um, they're going to basically do what you need to do to get the deal done. If they're not motivated, then it's just going to be a tough deal. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Man, this has been an amazing time, an amazing uh, uh, hour and 13 minutes. Abraham, thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with us. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I think I'm going to probably be going back, hopefully not getting shiny object syndrome, but going back and watching over and over and over <laughs> this this particular episode. Now, this, this is fun because I do a lot of podcasts and I do a lot of like Zooms and stuff like that, but like it's almost always real estate. And I could talk about real estate forever. Like you could, I could teach you stuff in real estate that like is because I do a lot of stuff nobody else does. But awesome. but I don't get to talk about business as much. And I love business. That's like I'm passionate about business. So it's fun that mo you know most of this whole thing was about business, which is kind of cool. Now, if you were just starting out, like I, I'm sure there's some guy, some somebody like Joel who's uh, just getting started. Would you think that you know having a broader thing? to look at like you're buying businesses would be a better way to start out than real estate. Or do you think that real estate would be a smarter play for him? Well, it depends on your personality and what, and what you like and what you're good at. Right. There's some people I know that like, just like doing real estate and they don't want to mess with business. And there's people I know that like doing business and don't want to mess with real estate. It's, it's a different type of person, you know, potentially, um, you know, which is weird to me because I love both so much, you know, similar, like the people that are yeah. like, you know, people that are really good at, at, at business don't really aren't really good at real estate. People that are really good at, at, at real, like like when you go to mentorships, and I'm in a ton of different mentorships for whether it's business or real estate. 
the business, the people that do real estate don't really know business that well. They know business some, but they couldn't teach a mentorship on business. And the same and vice versa, where I'm like, I could teach you on equally as much as anything as, as you know, I'm not as good as pace in real estate, but like underneath pace, I, I would be, I would argue that there's nobody that could teach you as, as well. I mean, pace is like at another level, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I could teach real estate at a really high level and I could teach, you know, business at the highest level that, that exists, you know, cause I've done it all, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm buying more properties than anybody, uh, cash. I'm buying more properties than anybody creatively besides pace and, um, and same thing with business. That's awesome. That's amazing. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm torn. Do I, do I start wrapping it up now or do we ask some more questions? You guys got any more questions you want to ask Abraham? Oh man, I could probably sit here all day, but <laughs> yeah, I can too. But we, we, we could do another one another day too. Oh uh, yeah, you know what? That'd be awesome because I, I think that um, yeah, I think we could probably do a, sit down, and rewatch this like Justin was talking about, and come up with a whole series of questions just watching the podcast we just did with you. Yeah. I, I don't know who said it, but somebody just somebody said pure gold, dropping pure gold. It was Elizabeth, and and yeah, wow, this this has been pure gold. Thank you so much. If anybody is interested in um, in in business, though, um, you should definitely. Uh, well, first of all, anyone that's watching should definitely friend me on Facebook. I'm on Facebook all the time. Obviously, okay. obviously, you know, um, you know, sign up for my Instagram and YouTube, everything else. But um, YouTube, I'm I'm posting a couple of videos every week. And, and Facebook, I'm, I'm on there all the time. So um, you should definitely friend me. I'm, I'm friends with almost everybody that uh, I know and, and sub to and everywhere else. I mean, um, that's how I end up communicating with everybody, email and, and Facebook. But um, if you have any interest in business, like I, the guy that I was telling you about that I'm in his mentorship, that's, I'm in a, like, there's only a few mentorships for business. I'm in them all. And they all suck pretty much besides this guy, Carl. And uh, there's another one that's okay, but um, Carl has like some programs that are like anywhere from like 200 bucks all the way up to, you know, 10,000 like cases. But um, if you're interested at all, you know, buy some, he has like a free 10 day one and, you know, just check it out. And that, that's kind of like a little taster of what, of what you could learn. And then if you get more interested, you know, hit me up. We could, uh, you know, I could always answer your questions anyway. I, I answer everyone's questions no matter what. If anyone at message me a question that I, I always answer. I've never not answered anybody. Yeah. And you're cool. super active in sub two as well. So yeah, if anybody's yeah. got a uh, like creative deals, they're trying to get rid of, uh, where are you buying uh creative? Where am I not anywhere? I buy anywhere. Awesome. So, so, here, so if here's you've got creative deals for sale, track you down and uh, yeah. you're, you'll want to take a look. I buy, I buy cash deals only in Atlanta in the Atlanta market. Okay. I only buy cash deals, creative deals. I have all over the country and, I actually made a post in in the sub two group like I don't know a, like a few weeks ago a month ago that if anybody so I went to the golden ticket you know that Pace had in uh, whatever it was a month or two months ago and yeah. um, I was, got really friendly with some people and they yeah. bought they bought a few sub twos and I was like well how come you haven't bought any in the last few months they're like well every time I bought a sub two I had to put down twenty grand or ten grand or thirty grand I have four or five now I ran out of money I can't find anymore I was like. Well, do you still find good deals on sub twos where you're at? And they're like, yeah, but I just, I, you know, I can't find a, a private money lender or I can't, you know, I was like, you know what? I will not, I won't lend money for um, a sub two because I won't lend in second position, especially out of Atlanta. I don't lend money. But what I'll do is if you find a good sub two deal, I'll partner with you. I'll go 50 50 mm -hmm. with you. We'll each own 50% of the business. We, we each own 50% of the property. I will loan you your half of the money that you need at 1% interest. So, for every that's amazing. For every ten thousand dollars I loan you, you have to give me a hundred bucks a month. Big deal, yeah. right? Um, but basically, so since I made that post, I've done five different deals with five different people in sub two that I'm partners with on deals in every five different all Texas, Arizona, Detroit. I mean, all over the place, Florida. So yeah, I don't, you know, I'll buy anywhere if if I just want them to be the one that you know, understands that market and, and can manage it or have a property manager that can manage it. And uh, yeah, it, it's got to be a good deal. Like to me, what, what, what's a good deal? If you're able to put down 10% or less, uh, you know, for the entry fee, um, if it cash flows, um, if you're buying it and it has some equity, you know, those are the ones that are best, the best deal. And obviously if it's more than 10%, you know, um, entry fee, I mean, I'll, I'll still look at them. I still do some of those, 
but then the price got to be good or the cash flow has got to be better or, or something. But um, a really good deal is 10% or less entry fee, you know, cash flows at least three, 400 bucks after your fees. And, um, you know, you're getting some sort of deal on the, you know, toward the ARV, although that's not, the, that's not really that important, but, um, and oh, I know. Uh, yeah. I'm not crazy. About hold, right. Huh? All of these are for hold, right? Oh I, yeah. Every single one that I partnered with, I hold, I, I have, well, I say hold, but we wrap probably most of them. I, I probably wrap half of them or more. So it, do you consider wrap a hold? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, a, a wrap is somewhat of a hold. It's a, it's a low maintenance hold. So, I mean. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it is a hold and it's not a hold. It's one half dozen the other. But yeah, yeah, it's sort of a hold. I mean, I, I you could, it's a hold that you don't own technically, but yeah. Right. It's cash flow. It's <laughs> technically, a hold, a hold technically is something that you own. A wrap you don't own, but you're technically, it's the one hold that you're not, you know, so yeah, it's like however you want to call it. Yeah, uh, it's a, a hold without depreciation, right? Yeah, I don't like I don't like um, buying a property to bank on it being a short term rental or mid term rental. It's got a cash flow as a long term rental um, because every single month for the last year, short term rentals are getting worse and worse, and uh, they're getting banned in a lot of cities. Like half the cities in Atlanta now don't even allow it anymore, or they have crazy restrictions. Where like a few years ago, that wasn't like that anywhere. Um, so I, I see it getting harder and harder. And plus, I know so many people in the short-term rental business that are um, doing a lot worse now than they were. Some of them are still doing good, but not anywhere near what they were doing. And some are getting out of it totally because they're not able to make money. So I, I can see that trend happening more and more. So I would never buy anything um, banking on a short-term rental. It's got a cash flow as a long-term rental. Yeah, that, that's, that was always... I think before short-term rental became the new Sony object for everybody, that um, the people that were going into it early always advise exactly what you're saying there. Make certain your fallback position is a long-term rental that you can always do that. I, I'm not certain how many people have made mistakes since then, but yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, we're seeing this advice. trend. We're seeing this trend all over the country where you know, little nephew Sam. Uh, cause it's local governments, not, not federal government, but little nephew Sam has realized that there's big money to be made in these short term yeah. rentals. So they either take him over and, and, uh, mm -hmm. blow up the deal. So it's so hard uh, that you can't do it and they're getting their cut or they, or they outlaw it completely. Yeah. And it's just getting worse. But I buy, I mean, I've been buying at least, at least two creative deals, real estate deals every week. So a lot of times three. And consistently and um, mostly in Atlanta, but really all over, all over the place. Uh, but mostly in Atlanta. I mean, I'm more aggressive in Atlanta because I know the market well. And, you know, I, I don't mind buying stuff. that need a little bit more work in Atlanta. Like if I buy stuff out of Atlanta, I don't want to buy stuff that needs much work because it's just a hassle. But um, unless I have a good partner there, you know, that I buy it with that, you know, makes me comfortable that, that they can do the work. But um, yeah, I mean, my goal, my goal is to partner with, as many people as possible in, in sub two. And I'm in Astro flipping. I'm in a whole bunch of groups and I've actually just did a deal with Astro flipping person um, uh, this week or last week we closed on, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think it'd be cool to one day own, own a, a sub two or owner finance property in every single state. So I'm like, uh, I'm like 20, I'm getting close to 20% of the way there. So I still got a while to go, but I don't know if I could do every state, but that'd be cool to one day in a, in a couple of years, have a partner, it was somebody in every. Now, I'm not sure if I want to get us off on another um, rabbit trail because your time is important. But um, one of the questions that popped into my mind was, are, are there states in buying businesses to avoid like there are in buying houses? Okay. It's the same exact states that you don't want to buy houses in. It's the same exact states you don't want to buy businesses. This is the Democratic states. The Democrat states are very, very not business friendly. They're very, very not real estate friendly. So would I, would I buy in those states? Yeah, sure, I would, of course, and I do. But those are the ones that you got to be really careful of. And, and, and you know, those are the ones that you're going to have problems. Like I had, I had um, businesses, a lot of businesses in California and Chicago and, and New York. And those are the, you know, the three of the worst, right? Um, in California, um, I, they have crazy laws, like literally different than every other state. And I actually got sued like, uh, like five years ago, six years ago 
by um, and some employees because I didn't pay them overtime correctly. Now, if they were in any state besides California, it would have been paid correctly, but California is a different overtime law and I didn't know it. And my HR person wasn't in California. So, you know, I ended up settling for like a hundred and some thousand dollar, like crazy lawsuit. And the only reason why is because there's attorneys that literally call every single employee to say, look, you know, we could do a class action lawsuit and get you all this money. And, you know, it's the attorney. Like, mm -hmm. So what did I break? So in, in every state, in, in Georgia, in pretty much every state, anything over 40 hours a week is overtime. Right. So um, I always pay overtime. Of course, I've done it ever since, you know, ever since I had a business. In California, it's, that's not overtime. Overtime is not over 40 hours. Overtime is over eight hours a day. So mm -hmm. if somebody works nine hours a day, you have to pay them overtime in that one hour. Why? Well, I didn't fucking know that. And, um, and instead of just being able to pay someone that extra you know, time and a half for those few hours I missed, you know, no, there's like a million dollars in penalties, a million dollars in fees, a million dollars. You know, so like before you know it, for like you, you didn't pay somebody 500 bucks or a thousand bucks that you maybe you should have over the last couple of years. Now you have to pay them like 30,000 bucks because so that's, that's why California and New York and Democratic states are bad because those laws are, are you know, and you got to really, you know, it's, it's, part, it's partly my fault. I didn't have an HR director in California and I should have known to get, you know, someone that knows the laws, they're better and make sure we did it. But there's so many laws that they have in these, in these states that um, you can't know them all. And you just got to be really careful because you think you're doing it right. But, you know, there's something there that that's not. Or it changes underneath you. That's that's yeah. really frustrating as well if you can't keep track of it. So. Yeah, there is a lot of change in those states. Well, um, we're almost at an hour and a half. I think I'm going to go ahead and do the housekeeping now and let folks yeah. know about some of the stuff we've got coming up. Monday through Friday, we have the Growing Your Mindset podcast with Adam Diaz and myself. It's a half hour where we just help get you set up so that you can hit your day with the proper mindset. And we go through uh, different things. Um, we do um, affirmations at the end of the show. It, it's a great time. Please join us for that. Monday through Friday, growing your mindset. Um, of course, every Friday, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, we do the Three Amigos Grow Giver podcast um, with Stephen Crawford, myself, and Malcolm Finlayson. That's what you're watching right now. We're going to have a special one of those this week. We're going to be having, um, or this coming week, we're going to be interviewing Tanisha Epps, who is doing a midterm rental business. Um, she does amazing. And we're going to get to um, uh, introduce you to her and let her tell you about what she does. That one is going to be a special show, not at the regular time. That's going to be Thursday of next week, 830 a.m. Central Central Standard Time. Then, of course, we're having our Friday show as well, and we'll be um, interviewing Munif from the Sub2 community, Munif Saza. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, yeah. We'll have to ask him when we get him on here, but uh, Munif is an amazing guy, and we're so thankful for all of the support, all of you watching these shows. Um, those of you who have signed up for the Grow Giver community, thank you so much. That's on Facebook. It's www.facebook.com forward slash the Grow Giver. Please help us grow that. And also thank you for liking and subscribing to the um, YouTube channel. Um, it, your support there is is really really appreciated. Abraham, this has been so amazing. Thank yeah, you. So thanks. Much. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Munif, you said something about Munif. I actually have two properties. I'm partners with him right now on, awesome. and uh, I bought a lot of properties from Munif. So Munif is awesome. Love it. Very cool. So, um, I guess without any further ado, we'll see you guys in the next one.